So shall we start, sir? We are ready. We are ready to start. Good evening, respected doctors. I am Ramanuja, journal business manager from MSN Labs, Hyderabad. So on my personal behalf, on behalf of MSN Labs, I welcome master faculties and guest doctors for today's evening session on awareness on pulmonary arterial hypertension. Before we start the session, I would like to give a brief introduction about MSN Laboratories. So innovation resonates a sense of purpose in the evolution and exist existence of human life. The creative capacity of a human mind has always been the source of inspiration. We believe every life matters and everyone deserves quality medicine. Apart from the efficacy, affordability, and accessibility, we want to be the first to touch and impact human lives. We are MSN, MSN Research for Better Medicine. The quest for innovation drives us to serve better and better today and tomorrow. MSN has got one of the Asia's largest integrated pharmaceutical APA and formulations R&D center. And MSN meet the global Indian pharmaceutical company. MSN has got global presence turnover crossing 600 million US dollars and MSN has got presence in 65 countries globally and eight offices worldwide, including US and UK. MSN has got 11,000 workforce globally. MSN has got won the trust of more than four crore customers across 65 countries. MSN as an integrated state-of-the-art R&D center and 14 manufacturing facilities in India and US, USA. MSN making Tricolor proud, research for better medicine. Indian spirit making Tricolor proud, MSN has got 250 plus products in pipeline, 100 abbreviated new drug applications submitted in US market. MSN has got 600 patents globally and 25 products approved in US market. MSN has got world's largest drug master filings, that is 715 in US. And MSN has got 20 plus products tentatively approved by US. US. And MSN has got 45 dossiers submitted in other major markets like Europe, Canada and Australia, and MSN has got 17 products commercialized in US market. MSN's first time in India launches are, in 2013, we have launched the Prasso Grill, Febuxostat, Tependalol, and Tolvaptin. And 2015, MSN has launched Bosentan, Dexlansoprazole, Proflumilast, and Veladazone. And in 2016, MSN has launched Loracidone. And 2017, Ambricentan, Amlotriptan, Sildosin, Azilsartan, Miravigran, Mesitentan, and Riosigat. In 2020, MSN has launched Trentin. And now in 2021, MSN has launched Dapagliflazone, that is Dapa 1, Sacubital Valsartan combination for heart failure, Tofacitinib, and Briva Next. MSN has got some pH innovations in pulmonary, especially in pulmonary arterial hypertension. So we have launched the Safa Bosentan in 2009 and Tadovas, that is Tadalafil in 2012, PDE5 inhibitor. And we have also launched selective ERA endothelial receptor antagonist, Ambricentan with the brand name Pulmonix in 2012. And 2013, MSN has launched Sildenafil citrate, that is PAH. And 2017, we have launched a combination of Amrisentan plus Tadalafil, that is Palmonex kit. And 2018, MSN has launched Mesitentan and also Riosicar. We would like to partner with the doctors in practice. MSN's expertise of research to innovate brought first time in India launches to support super specialists in bringing down Indian patient sufferings. Who to serve? Who to better stand by you, a company with global research, global manufacturing, and global quality. Company which has got acquired trust globally. We at Amazon on a journey to serve you better and better. To partner in creating awareness on pulmonary arterial hypertension, approach for emerging treatment option that to increase the patient's life expectancy and quality of life. So with this introduction, I would like to call today's our first speaker, Dr. Murli Mohan, sir, is a senior consultant pulmonologist from Narayana Hrudayalaya Hospital, Bangalore. He is also the director of the Department of Internal Medicine at Narayana Hrudayalaya. He was earlier professor and head of the Department of Medicine at Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Medical College, Bangalore. In 2015, he was awarded the FRCP by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow. His area of interest in obstructive airway disease 
interstitial lung disease, interstitial lung disease, and pulmonary hypertension. Dr. Murli Mohan has published various national and international publications, and recently he contributed as author to the Global Burden of Disease Study. And we have also got Dr. Ajay Handa sir, he is also a senior consultant pulmonologist from Sakara World Hospital, Bangalore, and Dr. Has uh, uh, done his MD from AF uh, MC Pune and DM Pulmonary Medicine from PGI Chandigarh. He has also an experience of 31 years in armed forces and retired as a brigadier. He is also a faculty in National Guidelines for COPD, Pneumonia, and Spirometry. He has uh, Dr. Ajay Handa sir has got 45 publications in various national and international journals. His area of interest are diffuse lung disease and pulmonary hypertension. And we have another speaker, Dr. Sayed Jolkarnan uh, Toshid, pulmonologist from Narayana of Ayalaya Hospital, Bangalore. He's a senior consultant pulmonologist. Dr. Sayed Jolkarnan trained in lung transplant from Toronto General Hospital, Canada. And his area of interest in semi-rigid uh, pleuroscopy, pulmonary psychology, pulmonary vascular disease. He published several papers on various lung diseases in both national and international journals. He plays a key role in Candle's book of cardiology. He started using cry cryo in plural biopsy and published the same in uh, JO, BIP, and he also involved as a reviewer in various indexed journals. With this introduction, as, a, as an expert and super specialist in pulmonary medicine, I would request Dr. Murli Mohan to take over the session. Thank you very much. Dr. Murli Mohan, sir. Yes, thank you, Mr. Ramanuj. I was waiting for the slide share to stop so I could start sharing my screen. Uh, thank you uh, for this kind introduction. And I am actually changing my topic a little uh, because, you know, I realized that our other two speakers are going to be speaking on group three and group four pulmonary hypertension. And I thought rather than just speak on diagnosis, I would put a little bit on diagnosis and also add something on, uh, you know, the treatment of group one pulmonary hypertension, which I think is, you know, uh, equally important. So I'm going to talk about a bit of diagnosis and a bit of treatment uh, and hopefully not encroaching on uh, Brigadier Handa's and Dr. Syed's uh, talk. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here with two good friends and with MSN partnering in this, uh, I think, a very, very important session. Yeah, so... This is my conflict of interest statement. And I bring you greetings from Bangalore. As you can see, beautiful city, more beautiful during the lockdown because there were fewer vehicles. And of course, I and Dr. Syed, we both come from the Narayan Tridhyalia Mazam Shah Shaw Medical Center. Uh, this is the cardiac building on the left and our multi-speciality hospital on the right. And I particularly put these two together because, you know, Pulmonary hypertension involves both these areas, cardiac, as well as many other systems, predominant of which is the lung. And it's said that the pulmonary circulation lies in the territory between that of the cardiologist and the pulmonologist, but is understood by neither. And that's true, but it is changing. And over the last 20 years, I think we've understood a lot more about pulmonary hypertension, both its etiology and how to manage it. And I'll show you right at the end how things have improved over time. So one of the main things I wanted to speak about was to revise the major groups. Uh, and I'll talk about treatment for each group. I will be speaking on group one. Uh, Brigade Handa will speak on group three. And Dr. Syed will speak on group four. So the plan is to cover the three most important groups involved. Group two is cardiac. And I'll come back to that. So when we say pulmonary hypertension, what exactly do we mean? So now we have fairly clear-cut criteria to decide what is pulmonary hypertension. And we now define it by hemodynamic characteristics. So pulmonary hypertension is defined by a mean pulmonary artery pressure. I'll emphasize this is mean pulmonary artery pressure of greater than 20 millimeters of mercury at rest. If you look at most 
echocardiography reports, they will not give you the mean pulmonary artery pressure. They will give you the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. And from that, we have to calculate the mean pulmonary artery pressure. And we can take that up later if time permits. And within this group, we rec recognize two types, what is called pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, where the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, also known as the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, is less than 15 millimeters of mercury. And post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, where the pressure is greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. What do we mean by this? What do we mean by pulmonary artery occlusion pressure? Basically, you, when you do a right heart catheterization, you take a Swan-Gans catheter, a uh, pulmonary artery flotation catheter, advance it, float it into the smallest vessel, which completely occludes the tip of the vessel. So the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure now reflects the left atrial pressure. So when we say pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, we mean the uh, left atrial pressure is not high. So whatever pressure we are finding, which is high, is in the pulmonary artery or the pulmonary circulation itself, excluding the pulmonary veins. However, when there is post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, it's reflecting the pulmonary venous pressure and in turn the left atrial pressure. So very often post-capillary pulmonary hypertension is secondary to heart disease or pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. And that's what these hemodynamic definitions you know, reiterate. You can have pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension which is seen in what is called group one pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary arterial hypertension. It's seen in lung disease, which is what Professor Handa is going to talk about, in group four, which is what Dr. Syed is going to talk about, and group five, which is when we don't quite know the exact cause and there are multiple mechanisms involved. You can get isolated post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. That means there is no pre-capillary involvement at all. And that is seen typically in pulmonary hypertension, which occurs due to heart disease, for example, in left to right shunts, which have isenmengerized and therefore the pressure has gone up. Or in uh, left heart disease, typically these days we are seeing it more and more, recognizing it more and more in diastolic dysfunction, what is called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or just advanced diastolic dysfunction. And we can also see it as a part of other diseases where multiple situations are operating. And we see it in combined pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension, where not only is the main pulmonary artery pressure high, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is also high. But in these patients, unlike in isolated post capillary pulmonary hypertension, the pulmonary vascular resistance in high, is high. So you have not only left heart disease or pulmonary venous uh, hypertension, you also have involvement of the pulmonary arterial vessels and their branches, the pulmonary arterioles also. So this is a combined pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension. This can occur in heart disease and in conditions, for example, like sarcoidosis. So if you see sarcoidosis is, uh, I'll come back to that. So let me define the main groups. First of all, there are five groups we recognize in pulmonary hypertension. Group one, where the disease is recognized in the arteries and arterioles themselves. There is muscularization of the arteries. There is change in the arterial wall and the primary disease is in the arterial wall itself. I'll come back a little more to this. Group two is, as I was just telling you, when there is left heart disease, which provokes rising pressure in the pulmonary venous system. This reflects back into the pulmonary capillaries and that leads to pulmonary hypertension. Group three is where there is hypoxia or structural lung disease so advanced that it is reducing the pulmonary vascular beds cross, beds cross sectional area, and that leads to pulmonary hypertension. And that uh, Dr. Handa will deal with in detail. Group four is due to pulmonary artery obstruction. Now, what causes the obstruction? There may be many things. And Dr. Syed will tell you that while clots emboli into the pulmonary artery are the commonest, there will be many other causes of obstruction, including tumor and parasites and so on. And finally, there are multiple causes that operate. One of them is, as I was just saying, sarcoidosis. And in sarcoidosis, you tend to have lung disease, which would put it into group three pulmonary hypertension. You can have heart disease and infiltration of the ventricle muscle by sarcoid, which can give you group two disease. 
And sarcoid can even involve the pulmonary arteries, giving you vascular involvement or group one disease. So this is a very interesting group where multiple mechanisms can operate. If you can identify one particular mechanism as being important, for example, lung disease is predominant and there is little or no heart disease, then you can still call it group three. If you can't clearly define which is the main contributing factor, then put it into group five. And why is this important? This is important because your treatment plan will depend on which group you decide. If you look at the details of these conditions, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is what I'm mostly going to focus on, is either idiopathic of unknown cause, heritable associated with certain genes, which we are better and better recognizing these days, drug or toxin induced and one of the main drugs was the anorectic agents like fenfluramine. It can also be associated with other systemic disorders, connective tissue disorder. The classic example is systemic sclerosis. In about 0.5 to 1% of HIV patients, you tend to get pulmonary hypertension, which is typically a group one. In patients with portal hypertension, you can get associated pH and this is called portopulmonary hypertension. You can see it in congenital heart disease, not due to group two. So this is a pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. And worldwide, schistosomiasis is one of the most important causes of group one pulmonary hypertension, where the schistosoma uh, larvae or eggs get deposited in the pulmonary artery circulation, and then they provoke an inflammatory reaction. So unlike group four, where, for example, hydatid cysts have been known to block the pulmonary artery, and I think Dr. Syed will show you an example. Here it is the inflammation that is being provoked that causes the pulmonary hypertension. Hence, correctly, it belongs to group one. And then, of course, you can have other causes where the pulmonary capillaries are involved, pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, and so on. I'm not going to go into the other details. I'm sure our fellow speakers will be talking about it. As I said, group five is not going to be spoken about today, but it involves usually one of the other groups. So we will focus on the other groups mainly. Whenever you see a patient with pulmonary hypertension, apart from knowing which group he belongs to, it's also important to know which functional class he or she belongs to. So the WHO classes, which are used to uh, define the functional state in pulmonary hypertension is very similar to the NYHA class. In fact, there's really no difference. In class one, you have no limitation of activity. In class two, you have slight limitation of activity. In class three, you have marked limitation of activity. So even walking around inside the house can provoke breathlessness or other symptoms like extreme fatigue and dizziness, which are often more typical symptoms of pulmonary hypertension rather than breathlessness. The many patients cannot distinguish between breathlessness and fatigue. And finally, Symptoms occurring at rest or with any activity, very minimal activity, is class four symptoms. So these classes are important. Notice that the etiological cause is groups and the functional state is class. And why is this functional class important? It's because survival is very closely linked to functional class. So you look at class two, functional class two and class one, they have a very good survival going on for more than 36 months. In fact, even the five-year survival is better than 80%. However, class four, the five-year survival, the three-year survival is less than 30, three, uh, uh, less than 30%. And as this slide shows you, survival is, median survival is just about one and a half to two years. We usually say across pulmonary arterial hypertension, the five years of, sorry, the median survival is about 2.8 years. So pulmonary arterial hypertension is a disease with very, very poor survival in the past. Fortunately, things have changed. And why is functional class also looked at? Because a six minute walk distance, which is what you make a person do, you make them exercise, correlates very closely with functional class and also correlates therefore with mortality. So whenever we are looking at patients, what we measure is not just the functional class, but to get a nice number on it, we do a six minute walk distance. And six minute walk distance has been used as a surrogate marker for survival when new drugs are being tried in pulmonary hypertension. Remember that most studies are done in pulmonary arterial hypertension and pH is very different from pH. The term pH is often misapplied to all forms of pulmonary hypertension. It should be applied specifically 
only to group one pulmonary hypertension. Remember that only a minority of pH is due to pulmonary arterial hypertension. And pH is very different from pH, different etiologies, different treatments, different prognosis. And most of the studies of pulmonary vasoactive medications have been shown to be useful only in pH and not in most pH. And I'll come back to this in the question answer session if time permits. So what are the most important causes of pulmonary hypertension? It depends on where you do your study and what they're doing, uh, looking for. For example, the French registry suggested that idiopathic pulmonary hypertension accounts for almost 40% of cases. While, for example, uh, if you take connective tissue disorders, it's about 15%. The reveal registry said even higher, almost 50% was idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. And you actually look at group one, uh, it occupies most of group one. We did a study some years ago on looking at the group-wise distribution of pulmonary hypertension. Group one accounted for about a third. Group two for about 30%, almost the same. Group three lung disease was about a fourth of cases. And group four, this was disproportionately represented, probably because we are a major referral center for uh, surgery for group four chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And group five is about 6%, the smallest group. As you investigate patients more and more, you'll realize that fewer and fewer patients belong to group five, and you can fit them neatly into one of the other groups. So globally, the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension is about 1% of the global population. And if you take individuals aged more than 65 years, almost 10%, which suggests that we are terribly underdiagnosing pulmonary hypertension. It's far more common than we realize. And almost everywhere in the world, group two and group three, I'm sorry, that should be group three, are the most common causes of pulmonary hypertension, practically throughout the world. But the distribution is different. Developing countries like ours, and this is where 80% of the world's population lives, pH is few, frequently associated with congenital heart disease, various infectious disorders, including, as I mentioned earlier, schistosomiasis, HIV, and rheumatic heart disease. And typically occurs in those younger than 65 years. But you take the Western population or the developed countries, typically it's group two, and it's the group of uh, people who are more than 65 years old and often is associated with either heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and not so much valvular heart disease that we see very often. And this, for example, as I was telling you, is from South America, where schistosomiasis was by far the commonest cause almost twice as common as idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. So very often we don't diagnose pulmonary hypertension correctly. In fact, this study, I'm not going to go into the detail, showed that in a lot of cases, the wrong diagnosis is made. These uh, bold are the correct diagnosis. So very often in 25% to 50% of cases, the diagnosis is made wrongly. And they concluded saying that in spite of major efforts to educate medical professionals about pulmonary hypertension, their study demonstrated that patients diagnosed as having pH often receive misdiagnoses and are often prescribed pH specific medications contrary to guidelines. So I'm just going to briefly talk about the diagnostic algorithm and then I'll skip a lot of slides and I'll go straight to the treatment. So when you look at the diagnostic algorithm, you first look at what is the history, what are the symptoms and signs and laboratory tests, which may suggest that pH is present. Okay, it starts with that. You must have a high suspicion. So then when you have a high suspicion, the first thing you do is you do an echocardiogram. And based on the echocardiogram, you can decide whether the person has a high probability of pulmonary hypertension or a low probability of pulmonary hypertension. So the same symptoms can be present in patients with pH and without pH. And this is particularly common in patients with heart and lung disease, all of whom have, not all of whom, but a large number of whom have breathlessness, fatigue, dizzy spells, syncopal episodes, which are common to lung disease, heart disease, as well as pH associated with these conditions. So first have a high suspicion. And I think both our speakers will tell you that a disproportionate breathlessness disproportionate to the lung or heart disease should raise the suspicion that here we are dealing with somebody with pulmonary hypertension. Then you do an echo and there are certain echocardiographic features which will tell you, yes, there's a high probability 
an intermediate probability or a low probability of pH? We have time. I'll go into that in the question answer session. So if you have a high or intermediate probability, you then fast track the referral because as I told you, pulmonary hypertension has a poor prognosis. So you need to identify the high risk patients and start the appropriate treatment immediately. If on the other hand, there is a low probability, it's first useful to look for other causes of these symptoms and follow up. One of the first things we do after making a high probability diagnosis is do a ventilation perfusion scan or a CT pulmonary angiogram. If the VQ scan is abnormal, you refer to a pH expert center because in all probability you're dealing with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. If that is not present, you do assessment for left heart disease, including looking for shunts. And this may include not only what you've seen in a CT pulmonary angiogram, but may also include a bubble contrast echocardiogram and look carefully for other things like a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connections or a pulmonary AV malformation, which are often missed unless you look for them carefully. And of course, look for lung disease. If there is no clinically significant left heart disease or lung disease, you're probably dealing with group one pulmonary hypertension or some other cause that you need to look at in greater detail to pick up the exact cause. So refer to a pH expert center. So Four steps, assess the probability, identify the high-risk patients and fast track them, diagnose the common causes of pH and institute treatment for those. If none of those are present, and we're talking about group two and group three pulmonary hypertension, diagnose the rare causes of pulmonary hypertension association with a pH expert center. So moving on to pulmonary arterial hypertension, as I already mentioned earlier, it's a pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension and presupposes that you've ruled out group three, group four pulmonary hypertension and group two. All the different subgroups I showed you under group one, called group one, associated pH, heritable pH and all that, all share a very similar clinical picture. And you look at the microcirculation histopathologically, they're all almost identical. And these are the changes that you see. This is a normal pulmonary artery in cross-section. And you can see the caliber of the thing is wide. When the person progresses, initially there's vasoconstriction. And this is true of practically all the groups that you'll come across, but more specific for group one. So initially there's vasoconstriction, which reduces the cross-sectional area. But then there is additionally arterial remodeling and often a lot of inflammation, and that's a tertiary lymphoid follicle. And you can see lymphocyte, uh, lymphocytic infiltration in the adventitia and the media of these vessels. And then there is increasingly what are called plexiform lesions, where because of intimal hyperplasia and hypertrophy, as well as medial hyperplasia, you will get new intima. And this is going to look a lot like this. This is sometimes called an onion peel or an onion skin appearance because it's like cutting across an onion. You'll see whirls of muscle and intima. And finally, because of the sluggish flow through these narrowed vascular channels, you'll get thrombosis locally and that converts into fibrous material. So these are the four stages and you can see the gradual diminution from a normal caliber to a very, very narrowed vessel. So it's not surprising that pulmonary hypertension becomes progressive and becomes impossible for the right ventricle, which is not well adapted to pump uh, blood through at, against high resistance. So the right ventricle fails and you get all the features of core pulmonary. So we recognize different causes, inflammation. So you'll see typically inflammation occurring in connective tissue disorders in association with the blood vessel. There are genetic factors, which is characteristic of heritable pulmonary hypertension. You'll see a change in the vascular tone which can occur in all groups. And more and more, we are recognizing that it's not just genetics, but epigenetics, which play a big role and modify the course of disease. So very often I've seen patients with what starts out as something like an ASD, but the ASD is corrected early. So today, for example, I saw a patient who had an ASD, but she's progressed to severe pulmonary hypertension, despite her ASD being corrected at age four. Of course, she had a further leak. She probably has a PFO. But we've seen lots of patients where, despite the initial correction, they continue to progress. And that seems to be due to a combination of genetic and epigenetic factors. 
So these are the things that I mentioned earlier, intimal proliferation and fibrosis, medial hypertrophy, vascular remodeling and vasoconstriction, the very pathognomonic plexiform lesions and intravascular thrombosis. And all these lead to right ventricular strain and dysfunction. So I'll move on to the treatment part of it. At a decade ago, idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, as it was called then, primary pulmonary hypertension was a dreaded disease with a quoted median survival of just 2.8 years. But now we've got a change in this very dismal scenario and we therefore need to decide what are we treating. So survival in pulmonary arterial hypertension or pulmonary hypertension depends on the cause. If it is pulmonary arterial hypertension, that is this blue line, you know, the cumulative survival has been about, as I mentioned, about five years uh, overall, but median survival in uh, group one is mostly around 2.8 years earlier. Now it's improved. This is, these are later studies. As you can see, this is 2013, where survival is improved. Survival in left heart disease is really good. The patient I saw today is actually uh, group two, secondary to left to right shunt, and she has already survived 13 years after diagnosis. And this is a fairly common thing. Survival in left heart disease is good. Survival in lung disease is the worst of all. So we've left Brigadier Honda with the worst uh, condition to, uh, to talk about. Even within group one, uh, idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension probably has the best prognosis, while all the others, for example, systemic sclerosis-associated pH, uh, pulmonary veno-occlusive disease has a really terrible prognosis. So it's very important to make the diagnosis correctly, to start treatment, and also to prognosticate. And one of the nice things is survival has improved over time. The, these equations that we're speaking about have been over various different years, and I'll come back to this. I won't spend time for lack of time today, but you can see that survival has improved tremendously in the time that we've been looking at pulmonary hypertension across the various different registries. So there are seven steps to treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. This is an integrated plan. You must first perform a thorough diagnostic evaluation. Decide whether what you're going to hear from me, or what you're going to hear from my colleagues is the most important part because each one of them, the treatment is very different. Consider which pH class the person belongs to. That is the functional classification. And what are the comorbidities because this will influence your choice of treatments. Assess the risk profile, and I'll come back to how you do it. In all cases, understand what the patient wants, what are his goals, what are her preferences. So you need to understand that. And along with the patient, you create an initial treatment strategy. It's not enough to treat the patient and forget about them. You have to have a very proactive longitudinal follow-up care plan. And this is fairly frequent because you need to be very proactive in modifying the treatment if you don't get the targets that you're aiming for. And finally, adjust your treatment approach based on clear metrics, objective measurements of effectiveness and tolerability. So let's not go into this. There are various important things that you need to look at. For example, if you have a connective tissue disease associated pulmonary hypertension, clearly you need to involve the rheumatologist and associated in ILD, we can manage along with the rheumatologist if it is CTD ILD. Similarly, if there's portopulmonary hypertension, you need to involve the liver specialist and maybe consider liver transplant very early. So each uh, comorbidity and each subclass, you have to treat appropriately. Uh, one of the important things, and I'm sure Dr. Syed will touch upon it, is sleep disordered breathing. Never forget about that when a patient has been dubbed as idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. I've had several patients where sleep disordered breathing was either the cause of the apparent PAH or was a significant contributing factor to the pulmonary hypertension along with pulmonary arterial hypertension. So one of the things we look at is what is the risk this patient has? This is different from the initial, what is the risk of having pulmonary hypertension that I referred to earlier? This is a risk stratification for pulmonary arterial hypertension, what is their risk of progressing rapidly? So you put patients into three risk categories, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And this is based on certain objective parameters. There are other risk uh, scores. There is what is called the reveal risk score. There is the European Society of Cardiology, European Respiratory Society risk score. 
I find the comparer is the simplest and it has been shown to be as uh, valid as the others, has as good a predictive value as the other two risk scores. So I tend to use this. We can at least do the first four ourselves. You look at the functional class, you do a six minute walk, you look at the BNP or the NT pro BNP, and depending on those, you can put the patient into one of these risk categories. Persuade your cardiology colleagues to do a right heart catheterization. And I hope that as we speak, more and more of you who are pulmonologists get inspired to do your own echocardiograms and right heart cats. The right atrial pressure, uh, the cardiac index, and the mixed venous oxygen all come into the rest of the risk uh, stratification. So we have three risk categories. You don't need to remember these. These are available as uh, on apps or on the internet and every patient you can risk stratify when they come in and for every follow-up. You need to do a regular follow-up using some of these same measurements, but also initially at least you will look at things like thyroid function, uh, pulmonary function and overnight oximetry as I already mentioned. And at all stages, consider palliative care after the initial assessment. If at six months you feel that the person is still very symptomatic, please consider palliative care in your options. We have three major therapies for pulmonary hypertension, the nitric oxide pathway, the prostacyclin pathway, and the endothelin pathway. So the nitric oxide pathway finally depends on nitric oxide, which causes vasodilatation and, uh, sorry, vasoconstriction and proliferation of the intima. So when you get uh, nitric oxide uh, reduction, it leads to uh, all these problems. So if you give the person nitric oxide, nitric oxide causes vasodilatation and reduces proliferation. So in the nitric oxide pathway, you're trying to achieve higher levels of nitric oxide at the uh, blood vessel, uh, specifically at the smooth muscle and uh, endothelial sites. How do you do that? You increase the production of nitric oxide. You can give the person inhaled nitric oxide, but obviously you cannot do that except in an ICU setting. So whatever nitric oxide is there, you try to stimulate its production. How is it done? It's done by using uh, what is called soluble guanylate cyclase, which increases the conversion of GTP, guanazyl triphosphate, into cyclic guanazyl monophosphate. So cyclic GMP causes vasodilatation and reduces the proliferation. So if you increase the NO, either by working on Riosigvat or you allow more of cyclic GMP by preventing its breakdown by using phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. So that phos phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors increase the conversion of cyclic GMP to GMP, which is not cyclic. And both these increasing its production or reducing its destruction increases the amount of available cyclic GMP and causes vasodilatation and proliferation. As I said, you can increase NO by giving NO, but that is a very, very short-lived molecule. So you can't use it normally on a therapeutic basis. You use it only in the ICUs. You can also work on the prostacyclin pathway. So the prostacyclin pathway, the IP receptor, similarly works on adenylate cyclase, just like cyclic GMP is acted on by guanylate cyclase and increase the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP, which has the same effects as cyclic B, uh, GMP, causes vasodilatation and reduces proliferation. How do you activate the IP receptor? You can use various prostacyclins. And therapeutically, we have epoprostenol, triprostenil, and iloprost, as well as beroprost. Most of these are intravenous, but now we are getting more and more triprostenil, which is inhaled. And you also have pumps, which can give this intravenously. But one of the great boons that has come is Selexipag, which is a prostacyclin analog. It works on the same IP receptor and is orally active. So it's a very useful way of working on the prostacyclin pathway and works differently on a different pathway from sildenafil or tadalafil, the PDE5 inhibitors. And the final pathway is the endothelin pathway. Now there are two endothelin receptors, the A and the B receptors. The uh, A and the B receptors stimulate vasoconstriction and increase proliferation. So if you block these receptors, you have the opposite of it. You reduce vasoconstriction, that is you cause vasodilatation, and you reduce proliferation. So what we're looking for is endothelin receptor antagonists. So you can have those which are 
relatively non-specific, which work work on both the ETA and ETB receptors, blocking them for centan and macitentan. And you have a pure ETA receptor blocker, which is ambricentan. And hopefully more and more of these are in the pipeline. And if you use a combination of all three, you get maximum effect because you're working on three different pathways and you never use two drugs working on the same pathway. So we have some defined treatments and some where the optimal treatment is not clear. And the defined treatments are only for pulmonary arterial hypertension, group one, which I'm talking about, and CTEF. Optimal treatments are not very clear for the other pathways and we leave it for now. And I'll spend a little time talking on Riosiguat, which is useful both in group one and in group four pulmonary hypertension. As I mentioned earlier, it stimulates soluble guanidate cyclase independently of nitric oxide. So even if there is no endogenous nitric oxide or exhaled or nitric oxide you get from outside, it increases the amount of NO. Whatever there is, it allows binding of the endogenous nitric oxide to soluble guanylate cyclase. So it's useful both in pH and in CTEF. Uh, what it does is it reduces fibrosis, reduces vasoconstriction, reduces proliferation, and reduces inflammation. So it works across multiple pathogenic pathways that I spoke about earlier. So I'm not going to go into details of these, but we can use all these drugs, PD-5 inhibitors, prostanoids, calcium channel blockers in a very small set of conditions, soluble gallelate cyclase inhibitors, and prostacyclin receptor agonists, which are different from the prostanoids. And what you must be very careful about is you must remember the common side effects of these and remember that you should never combine, for example, a PD-5 inhibitor with something like a, a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. So you never combine those two drugs. What are the effects of these drugs? This is a study which looked at Riosiguat comparing with placebo, and you saw a very good improvement in the six-minute walk distance, starting very early within the first week and carrying on. Patients who received placebo are also getting other treatments. And of course, there is a well-known placebo effect. Initially, there was an improvement, but later there was a tail-off and there was a disappointing tail-off. So obviously, other treatments also work to some extent, but Riosiguat produced a very big improvement in six-minute walk distance. And you know this translates into a better uh, survival because it improves the functional class. So one of the few drugs that has been shown to improve survival in large studies is Riosiguat. Several secondary endpoints also improved in these trials. The pulmonary vascular resistance came down very significantly. The anti-pro-BNP came down very significantly. The mean pulmonary artery pressure dropped significantly, as did the cardiac index improved. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure also improved. And the cardiac output was also, though not a pre-specified endpoint, was also improved. So the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure actually went up. And you'll say, how, how is this? This is because the right ventricular pressure improves, greater flow occurs through the pulmonary artery. And that actually tells you that there is an improvement in the overall status of the patient. That uh, was Riosiguat. The other new drug that came along was Selexipag. That was the Griffin trial. And again, you can see the same thing. Patients without an event, an event meaning admission or death, very early within the first month, you got a separation of the two lines and this continued to separate even at 36 months. So survival was improved without admission to hospital or death in patients who were put on Selexipag. And the same story with Massitentan at two different doses, 10 and 3 mg, you got good benefits, but the maximum benefit was with Massitentan 10 mg. This was a Serifin study. And you can see again, very early results in patients without an event, the same kind of endpoints that were used with the Griffin study. So Massitentan, Riosiguat, uh, Selexipag, all of them produced very good improvements. I'm not talking about the prostanoids because they've been around for a very long time. Calcium channel blockers should not be used without checking a right heart cath. And only in those who are what are called responders to a vasodilator challenge at the time of right heart catheterization, you see an acute vasodilator response, which is well-defined. You can use something like nitric oxide inhaled during the study. You can use adenosine or you can use uh, uh, one of the other agents like the prostanoids, which is not very useful, 
or you can use a calcium channel blocker directly, a rapid acting one like nifedipine. You must see a sustained response and then only you will see, call this a person, a CCB responder, calcium channel blocker responder. And even among these, very few of them continue to respond at the end of a year. So you need to keep following them. Anticoagulants, controversial. Some studies show that they improve survival. They prevent in situ coagulation, in situ thrombosis, sorry. And other studies show that there may not be a benefit. Newer studies show that they may be considered, there may be some benefit. So the treatment algorithm that you use, if the person is treatment naive, you confirm pulmonary artery hypertension, which means you rule out group two, group three, group four pulmonary hypertension. All people get general measures of supportive therapy. You do an acute vasoreactivity test at right heart catheterization. If they are vasoreactive, this initially is about 10%, but in the long run is only about 1%. You continue calcium channel blocker therapy and they respond really well. The vast majority are non-vasoreactive. So you risk stratify them using a score like the Compara score. Low risk, intermediate and high risk three combinations. Most patients, except the low risk ones, start off with initial combination therapy, which is oral. Very few patients, there is initial monotherapy and you reevaluate at three to six months. If they have now responded well and they move to low risk, you continue to just follow them up. If a patient comes to you already on therapy, you assess and it depends on, on which risk group they fall in. If they are low risk, you just continue the same treatment while following them up. Assume they were intermediate risk or in the course of follow-up, end up with intermediate risk, you add on therapy. So if they were on single drug, you make it a double therapy. If they were on double drugs, you make it a triple therapy. If they are high risk patients, you straight away put them on double or th triple therapy, reassess them, maximize the therapy if they remain in intermediate or high risk, and you refer for lung transplant evaluation. Dr. Syed is our expert on it. I think he will answer some questions if those come up. High risk patients straight away while being put on maximal medical therapy, are also referred for lung transplant evaluation. And this initial uh, treatment for high-risk patient will also be triple therapy, one of which includes a prostanoid. Either it should be a prostacyclin analog like Selexipag, or it should be a prostanoid like uh, triprostanil or Betaprost or one of those. So this is what I mentioned in brief. You look at the functional class, you look at the six-minute walk distance, and you look at the NT pro BNP. With these three itself, you can make a risk categorization. And those who are in high risk categories, you always, always do a right heart cath, echo and CPET in repeated fashion and consider whether to escalate therapy at all those points. At all points, look for treatable traits. Is there an arrhythmia? Is there iron deficiency? Are there infections? Is there hyperthyroidism? And treat them appropriately. I'm not going to go into this for lack of time. But genetics is playing an important role and we may soon be doing routinely genetic tests like we are doing for patients with lung cancer. And we may be moving from genes to understanding therapies and this is already coming. We understand the gene involved. They are specifically trying to target therapies. So day is not far when we'll be talking about uh, personalized medicine in pulmonary arterial hypertension also. And I'll leave you with this last slide, say last few slides. Survival has improved over time. This was a study published a few years ago, 2014, by Ogawa, looking at his entire population from Japan, looking at his entire population of heritable pH. And he was comparing it with survival. The NIH survival uh, studies were done between 1981 and 1985, which is when we spoke about a 2.8 uh, year, uh, five years, sorry, median survival. The French registry, which came on about 20 years later, already showed an improved survival. The reveal registry, which came on in the next decade, even better survival. But Okayama, looking at his data from 98 to 2009, about a decade then, showed that almost a 90 plus survival at more than five years. So five year survival of better than 90% in his uh, study, showing you that things are really, really improving. So we can see light at the end of the tunnel. Things are much better now than 10 years ago when I started being interested in pulmonary hypertension. We have a lot more drugs. It is up to us now to assess them properly, choose the appropriate treatment, 
And I leave you with some key points. Pulmonary hypertension is a pathophysiological state characterized by increased pulmonary artery pressure and increased pulmonary vascular resistant. pH is different from pH. Genetic factors are best characterized in group one pH, especially in heritable pulmonary arterial hypertension. Treatment should follow a step care approach and always take a pH expert center's uh, opinion at some point. And hopefully, survival in pH is already improving, and that too dramatically, but hopefully will continue to improve even more. So I'll thank you very much for your patient hearing and hand over to my colleagues. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Handa has already been introduced, uh, so I will not you know, take up more of your time invite my very good friend, uh, Brigada Handa, to take over and talk to us on uh, treatment of group three pulmonary hypertension associated with lung disease. Dr. Handa, I think you're muted. Am I okay now? Audible? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Murli, for uh, the kind words. And uh, one is that, you know, excellent... Uh, uh, overview of pulmonary hypertension and specifics of the therapy and the kind of work that you're doing. So it's a, a tough task uh, to follow you, but I'll try to do my best. Uh, I'm waiting for you to... Uh, is my slide visible? Uh, not yet. You started screen sharing. I think you may okay. have to. Uh, Sir, you open your uh, PowerPoint, then come to mm -hmm. screen sharing. Okay. One second. I'm a bit uh, slow at these things. If you're using a Mac, then you first share and then open the PowerPoint or Keynote. I'm not on the Mac um, conventional. So your screen sharing is pause. It says... It started, so you just have to open your PowerPoint now. Okay. So I go back to this. And am, I, am I able to... Are you able to see the screen? No. Not yet? Not yet, no. Okay. So you minimize your window, mm -hmm. go back to your PowerPoint, open the PowerPoint, automatically it will start sharing now. Meeting. Resume share. Is it seen now? No, it's not. Why don't Why don't you go back and start again? Um, Top uh, screen share. Sometimes that works. Top screen, Top screen share. share. Yeah. Okay. And then Top now open share. your PowerPoint. Mm, uh, that's the one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now put it into screen show. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so uh, sorry for the glitch and uh, I shall be talking about uh, group three pulmonary hypertension, which is pulmonary hypertension related to chronic lung diseases. And I'll start with the typical case, which all of us see. Uh, this patient got recently admitted. He is a two year old. He has been dyspneic for the last few months. He's been seen by his physician and uh, started on uh, medications with inhaler and oxygen for the last two months. He's using it for a few hours in a day, usually at night time. He got admitted with an infective exacerbation of the COPD and in an emergency, his saturations were 76%. He had the type one respiratory failure on the ABG with PO2 of 54 and a low CO2. Uh, in the ward, we subsequently got his echocardiography done, which showed a dilated RA and RV, uh, moderate tricuspid regurgitation and a very high pulmonary artery systolic pressure of 75 millimeters mercury. His left heart functions were fine. And the CT revealed a significantly emphysematous patient with a dilated main pulmonary artery. 
and we came to a diagnosis of COPD with severe pulmonary hypertension, core pulmonary and right heart failure. And uh, this is uh, uh, not a new scenario to all of us. Only thing he has been diagnosed about two to three years late. Uh, so uh, bringing the topic of group three pulmonary hypertension, the problem is on the rise. It's the second most common cause of pulmonary hypertension after cardiac diseases. The better diagnostic tools and greater awareness is leading to increased numbers and also the increase in uh, prevalence of both COPD and interstitial lung disease due to pollution and uh, you know, interstitial lung disease also being more diagnosed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as Dr. Murli said, it's the uh, group associated with the highest mortality with a poor median survival for about three years. Its mortality compared to eight age match group one pulmonary hypertension is almost 1.5 times. Uh, pH with uh, chronic lung disease puts a toll on the patient. It limits his exercise capacity. It makes him uh, have a poor quality of life. It increases his risk of hospitalizations. And, uh, you know, this uh, as a patient who has a main pulmonary artery dilatation more than the ascending aorta also makes the patient at a higher risk of hospitalization due to heart failure and infective exacerbations. Mortality in this subgroup of patients who have severe pulmonary hypertension, that is mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 35, is high and it varies with the type of underlying chronic lung disease which, uh, you know, the OSC subgroup who have uh, sleep disordered breathing have the best survival and uh, the interstitial lung disease with pulmonary hypertension has the worst survival, approximately 16% three-year survival and the COPD subgroup with the pulmonary hypertension has a survival somewhere in between. Uh, the group of conditions which uh, constitute the chronic lung disease associated pulmonary hypertension most commonly are COPD. In clinical practice, we would find patients with COPD most often followed by idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and the other, you know, interstitial lung diseases. Combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema is also an important group in the restrictive disorders. Then you see patients with obesity hypoventilation syndrome who have much, much more pulmonary hypertension than obstructive sleep apnea who usually have mild to moderate pulmonary hypertension. The chest wall disorders and the other developmental disorders also make, uh, make up the numbers. As Dr. Murli mentioned, specific lung diseases like sarcoidosis and Langerhans cell histiocytosis have more than one mechanism, so they do, do come into the group 5 pulmonary hypertension. And if they have only predominant lung problem, they would probably be classified as group 3. Uh, what is the problem with this group of pulmonary hypertension? One, the patient's uh, delay in coming to hospital thinking that the pulmonary hypertension, thinking that the symptoms of, uh, of breathlessness and fatigue are related to their primary lung disease and has been there for years together. They come after two to three years of it being significantly worse. And the second part is lack of clinical suspicion by the dealing primary physicians who don't suspect. Now with a greater availability of echocardiography and Doppler in almost all secondary and tertiary care centers, this should not be too much of an issue, but the only one aspect is the echocardiographic sensitivity depends upon the expertise of the individual who's handling the tool. Therefore, the sensitivity may not be as good as an expert as compared to the person who is uh, relatively a novice in echocardiographic assessment. In this matter, obviously, the technicians who are doing it need to be adequately trained and sensitized to look at pulmonary hypertension and not only look at the left side of the heart. Right heart catheterization is the gold standard of all uh, pulmonary hypertension diagnosis, especially in moderate to severe. And this is an uh, invasive test. It is, uh, you know, in, incurs cost. And there may be a hesitation to refer for this particular uh, evaluation because there's a limitation of treatment options, especially in group three pulmonary hypertension. There is a neglect of the chronic lung disease by patients who continue to you know, indulge in smoking despite being diagnosed with COPD. 
the poor compliance to standard treatment, we all know that, and uh, the uh, use of indigenous medications, some of which, especially herbal products, may induce pulmonary hypertension by the content of pyrolizidine alkaloids and uh, other contents which may be, uh, you know, uh, producing pulmonary arterial hypertension by itself. Oxygen hesitancy is a big, big thing. Uh, for a group three pulmonary hypertension, oxygen is the best pulmonary vasodilator. If he fulfills the criteria of long-term oxygen therapy with a PAO2 in the range of 55 to 59 with pulmonary hypertension, he should be on oxygen using it at least 16 to 18 hours. The more the use, the better it is. Even if it is used 24 hours, it will give him more benefit. But the limitations are one, the cost and you know the vast majority of our poor patients may not be able to afford the oxygen concentrator. The second is the misconception that dependence on oxygen is equal to a sense of dome or near to death. So this needs to be broken, especially when you diagnose pulmonary hypertension early, inform that the benefits of pulmonary uh, uh, hypertension, which will be uh, incurred when you use oxygen in an appropriate manner, not only does it improve the quality of life, it improves his ability to exercise and improves the longevity. Why is pulmonary hypertension in group three patients lethal? One is a diagnostic delay of almost two to three years. Second, the basic disease is not treated optimally. Third, I have already spoken about the oxygen not being used by most patients. And fourth, that anti-PH medications, which work beautifully in group one PAH, don't yield, uh, don't yield those desired benefits. Uh, why they don't yield the desired benefits is because the pathogenesis of group 3 pulmonary hypertension is complex and multifactorial. But the most important aspect is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And over a period of time, there is a loss of pulmonary vasculature and capillaries by the process of parenchymal fibrosis and emphysema. And the other uh, uh, inflammatory pathologies, vascular remodeling, perivascular fibrosis, and thrombotic angiopathy happen in a less, much lesser intensity. The main problem is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and vascular destruction by the process, the lung disease per se. So therefore, the pH drugs don't work so well in this uh, group of patients with uh, group three pulmonary hypertension, where the main problem is ventilation perfusion mismatch leading to hypoxemia. And theoretically, the vasodilators can actually worsen the ventricular uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. Thankfully, in most large studies in COPD as well as interstitial lung disease, no clinically significant worsening has been noted. And hence, uh, you know, these are uh, concerns which should be justified and probably even merit the hospitalization of patients who are being given this uh, anti-PAH medication in expert research centers. The second aspect is, as I mentioned, the pulmonary capillaries are lost and there is not much of vascular inflammation. Therefore, the pH medications don't work so well as they work in patients with group one where it has improved the survival from 2.8 years to almost seven to 10 years. But notwithstanding that, looking at this uh, usage of uh, anti-PH medication across the world, the survey from 2015 in 93 hospitals, they were used in uh, other indications apart from non-group 1 pulmonary hypertension. They were used most commonly in patients with lung disease and also in 77% in those patients who had heart disease-related pulmonary hypertension used in subgroup of patients who had a severe pulmonary hypertension with or without features of right ventricular dysfunction. Coming to the specific topic of treatment of chronic lung disease with pulmonary hypertension, the first aspect of treatment of pulmonary hypertension in chronic lung disease would be to assess the the severity of pulmonary hypertension after an initial screening echocardiography. They should all be subjected to right heart 
catheterization. It's a very, very uh, invasive test and it, it requires, uh, you know, uh, convincing, especially if you don't have too many uh, drugs to offer, but it must be done in those patients who are considered for a major surgical procedure like a lung transplantation because the outcome of a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension is going to be much worse as compared to those who have mild or no pulmonary hypertension. Also, it's recommended to be done in those who are undergoing major surgical procedures for their COPD like bullectomy or lung volume reduction. It's also recommended to be done in the patients who have a systemic sclerosis type of pulmonary hypertension because it could be belonging to group one or uh, group three and to see which is dominating. It's recommended to be done in patients with systemic sclerosis or overlap of systemic sclerosis with other conditions of uh, CTG. Uh, another uh, recommendation to do uh, 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 right heart catheterization is when there is clinical deterioration despite being optim on optimal medication for the lung disease. This is the group of patients which we should select and refer for right heart cath catheterization and convince them that this may make a change in their outlook in the, in the, in the way they you know, have their uh, life ahead. Uh, definitions are already covered by Dr. Murli. Only would like to bring out when the patient has got chronic lung disease with severe pulmonary hypertension, that is a mean of more than 35 millimeters mercury, or when the mean is slightly lower, but he has got a lower cardiac index, you would like to call it as a severe pulmonary hypertension with chronic lung disease, and that would need a little more aggressive looking at uh, with regards to the therapeutic strategies. Now, coming to the evaluation, apart from evaluating the pulmonary hypertension, you have to assess the severity of the lung disease, both in terms of its physiological compromise by spirometry and diffusion, and also the morphological severity by looking at the HRCT. So if the patient has a pulmonary vascular type of phenotype, that is, he has a component of lung disease which is mild, that is, the spirometric parameters are, are good between 60 and 80, FEC between 60 and 80, and a diffusion capacity, which is disproportionately low as compared to the spirometric findings. There is moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension with minimal or no abnormalities on HRCT. This patient has a pulmonary vascular disease as the major hallmark. Even if he has got a minor chronic lung disease associated, he may be considered for a referral to an expert center for getting appropriate anti-PH therapy after he is optimized with regards to his lung disease management. As against this, if you look at the chronic lung disease phenotype with pulmonary parenchymal or airway disease phenotype, where they have significantly abnormal spirometry values in obstructive and restrictive patterns, diffusion, which goes along with this extent of obstructive or restrictive changes, significantly abnormal HRCT, very mild or moderate pulmonary hypertension on right heart catheterization. Again, right heart catheterization is important here. And so this group of patients who has some pulmonary hypertension, but predominantly due to pulmonary parenchymal or airway disease should be just given optimal medical treatment, including oxygen. And there is no role for pulmonary arterial hypertension uh, uh, medications in this group of patients. So this group of patients that is a vascular phenotype needs to be identified. They are about five, one to five percent of patients of COPD. They worsen the patient's quality of life and increase the mortality. They have disproportionate hypocapnia, very reduced uh, diffusion capacity, and they may benefit from anti-PH therapy. A uh, summary of trials conducted across the uh, COPD PH have been largely disappointing with uh, mixed and inconsistent results in the various groups of drugs because the pathophysiology of pulmonary hypertension here is different. All the medications have been tried, including Riosigwat, which showed some improvement in pulmonary vascular resistance. Randomized trials with Riosigwat are ongoing. Uh, inhaled reposmil also has shown some benefit, but the pulmonary uh, spirometric findings decline. So this is an area of still ongoing research. Uh, coming to pulmonary hypertension with interstitial lung disease, this I mentioned to you is associated with a reduction in uh, longevity and a very high mortality, 14% uh, survival at three years. 
potentially serious complication commonly seen in IPF, combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema, and other fibrotic ILDs like uh, 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 chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis or CTD ILDs. It worsens the outcomes by increasing the risk of exacerbations, hospitalization, and death. In this subgroup, there are certain drugs which must not be used. As per the Artemis trial, ambrisintan was associated with worsening of the progression's free survival. May, namely, there was a drop in FVC or hospitalizations uh, in the group of patients who received ambrisintan, and this trial had to be stopped earlier because of harm and should not be used in patients with IPF pH was a recommendation. Similarly, Riosigward was tried in patients with uh, uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonias in almost 150 patients. This was terminated early too due to increased rate of adverse effects seen and also mortality in the Riosigward group. However, here, if you note the population was heterogeneous, apart from having the fibrotic DPLDs like IPF, NSIP, and HP, there were also a few cases of organizing pneumonia and acute interstitial pneumonia. So the future trials should have more homogeneous type of uh, uh, DPLDs and not try to bring in the conditions where the uh, medication uh, may have no role or you know may aggravate the condition. Uh, in, this is the uh, most encouraging trial of inhaled tripostinil, the increased trial, which was a randomized trial of uh, tripostinil in uh, 326 patients. And at 16 weeks, it showed an increase of uh, 21 meters in the six minute walk distance in the tripostinal group. And there was a drop of 10 meters in the placebo group. So mean weighted difference was 31 meters, which was statistically significant. Along with that, there was also a significant reduction in the clinical worsening, which included episodes of hospitalization, death and referral to lung transplantation, Again, a very statistically significant uh, result obtained. I wanted to just highlight this included majority of patients who were in this group were IPF, chronic HP, CTD, ILD, and CPFE. And there was an odd point to note that only 13% of them were on antifibrotics and 77% of them were not on antifibrotics. Probably if they were an optimal medical management for their underlying interstitial lung disease, the results could have been slightly better. Uh, of course, this was uh, across both groups and they were equally randomized. Now coming to just touching on the sarcoid, which was mentioned by Dr. Murli, uh, pulmonary hypertension in sarcoidosis is fortunately uh, not a very common entity, except for those who are you know, very advanced and heading for lung transplantation. It's seen in about three to 20%, but the presence of pulmonary hypertension increased the mortality by seven times. It can be in, uh, due to the involvement of the pulmonary uh, parenchyma, that is pulmonary fibrosis, and this is what most commonly we would see. However, there could be a pulmonary arterial hypertension type of phenotype with pulmonary vasculopathy. There could be thromboembolism, there could be left heart disease, and there could also be sometimes lesions like pulmonary venoocclusive disease. So they need to be really deciphered into which group, and hence it is rightly grouped in group five, where more than one mechanism may be at play. Coming to the uh, you know the lifestyle uh, change of uh, the pandemic, obesity and sleep apnea is on the rise. Lots of patients coming with new onset sleep apnea because of the weight they have put in in the pandemic. So uh, if you look at OSA, fortunately, the pulmonary hypertension is mild, is seen in only about 12 to 30 percent of patients. Surprisingly, uh, the mean pulmonary artery pressure does not correlate with the indices of apnea and hypopnea, also does not correlate too much with the you know, total time spent below 90% saturation. So therefore, the uh, likely negative intrathoracic pressure during episodes of apnea and hypopnea leading to left ventricular afterload changes is the cause of pulmonary hypertension here. So maybe it may eventually land up in... Uh, uh, group two. And this uh, one important thing is mean pulmonary artery pressure is reversible with the regular use of CPAP, which is a saving grace. However, if the pulmonary hypertension is uh, significant, then there's an increase in mortality of pulmonary uh, of OSA. So 
all patients with obstructive sleep apnea need to be screened for presence of pulmonary hypertension periodically and for like patients who have occult pulmonary hypertension without a cause before they are labeled as idiopathic pulmonary hypertension if they have any of the you know indicators of the stop bank score and a score equal to or greater than 3 they should be screened by an appropriate level 1 sleep study now there are certain food for thought for uh, all of us to uh, take home here patients with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension those who have uh, lung lesions on ct whether symptomatic or not fared worse than those who had no lung lesions and this is a retrospective analysis where three year survival was found to be 42% for those who had ct scan lesions as again 71% Uh, for those who had clear lungs, and this is uh, statistically significant. So, does the presence of lung lesions on CT scan alter the behavior of the pulmonary vasculopathy? The pulmonary arterial hypertension behaves differently. So, this is something which we need to look at. Does some uh, ventilation percussion mismatch set in, and does it change the behavior behavior of the disease? Another important uh, thing to look at is the occurrence of right ventricular dysfunction. we all know that right ventricular dysfunction is a major determinant of long term survival in patients with group 1 pulmonary arterial hypertension but is more and more being recognized as a reliable indicator of survival in patients with pulmonary hypertension in relation to chronic lung disease and as this study shows uh, when they compared patients with lung disease and patients with uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension though patients with lung disease had Uh, less severe pulmonary hypertension they had worse right ventricular systolic functions as measured by the right ventricular fractional area uh, cross section so the right ventricular dysfunction equals to poor outcomes in in uh, group 3 pulmonary hypertension in the same study they also found the composite outcomes in the form of death heart failure related hospitalizations when fully adjusted for other comorbid conditions were statistically significantly higher in patients with group 3 pulmonary hypertension with right ventricular dysfunction so right ventricle is probably the novel target of uh, you know uh, pulmonary hypertension in general and especially in group 3 pulmonary hypertension because apparently if the right ventricular dysfunction happens earlier at lesser pulmonary vascular diseases and uh, just contributes to the worsening outcomes of our patients with group uh, group 3 pulmonary hypertension this was found uh, also in uh, the aspire registry where uh, you know the patients who were having severe pulmonary hypertension with right ventricular dysfunction were given compassionate sildenafil or tadalafil and compared to standard therapy there was improvement in in a small subgroup of patient there was an improvement in pulmonary vascular resistance and uh, who functional class despite having worse Uh, pulmonary vascular resistance values so there are a small subset of patients who will respond but in this study they could not find what that predictors could be of how to predict a response to uh, anti ph medications so i'm going back to the slide where you have to identify the patients of pulmonary vascular predominant uh, pulmonary hypertension with a very small fraction of chronic lung disease Uh, so called pulmonary vascular phenotype copd or pulmonary vascular phenotype ild and those who have moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension on right heart cath after they are completely optimized with regards to their lung medication and oxygen they need to be considered on uh, trial on a clinical trial basis at expert center with the uh, you know use of anti ph medication so that the pulmonary arterial hypertension does not lead to right ventricular dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension related to chronic lung disease does not lead to right ventricular dysfunction which is associated with a poor outcome so it entails a multidisciplinary approach which is the way these expert pulmonary centers like narayana team headed by Uh, dr murli mohan uh, where the multidisciplinary team must be comprising uh, i am not uh, 
you know, having a multidisciplinary team at our center. So it needs a, a effort of a pulmonologist, a cardiologist, a radiologist, and a pathologist where the diagnostic uh, approach is to be deciphered. And then you formulate individualized treatment plans, which are goal-oriented, a very close longitudinal follow-up, and probably these patients can benefit by enrolling in a timely manner in a clinical uh, trial scenario for anti-PH medication. Uh, uh, of course, it should be done in expert centers. So I'm coming to one a novel treatment, which is the ARIA CVPH system. This is a novel endovascular device for disease refractory to pulmonary arterial hypertension related medications. Essentially, the stiffened and non-compliant pulmonary artery puts excessive load on the right ventricle. So this is like a intra-aortic balloon pump in the pulmonary artery, which inflates with systole and deflates in diastole and reduces the right ventricle afterload and improves the right ventricle to pulmonary artery coupling. And in a small elegant study of 10 patients with pulmonary hypertension, it improved the pulmonary compliance and improved the cardiac output. And there were no adverse effects noted. And this was a small acute hemodynamic evaluation study. So I'm sure that this device will bring our cardiologist back into the interest in treatment of pulmonary uh, hypertension related to chronic lung disease, related to heart disease, and uh, patients who are refractory to uh, medications or having a refractory pH. Uh, to conclude, uh, all patients with chronic lung disease who have disproportionate dyspnea or poor effort tolerance should be screened to pick up pulmonary hypertension early, especially in patients who are COPD, IPF, or other fibrotic uh, lung disease, including uh, CPAFE. The medication should be optimized for chronic lung disease, looking at their inhaler technique, nebulized delivery system, antifibrotic medication, emphasize the use of oxygen, for 16 to 18 hours in a day, if it is uh, low saturation of oxygen, even if it's used for 20 hours, 24 hours is uh, good, longer the better. Reassess your patients at about six to eight weeks with a clinical assessment, their dyspnea score, their functional status, their uh, blood gas and echocardiographic parameters. And if they have no change in these, they should be considered for referral to a specialized center for right heart catheterization and further treatment. Uh, we uh, need in the chronic lung disease subgroup certain focus trials with uh, patients who have severe pulmonary hypertension using clinically relevant endpoints like survival, hospitalization, and uh, quality of life and uh, dyspnea, uh, uh, six minute walk distance and dyspnea scores. A carefully selected patient may benefit from enrolling in pH uh, trials after appropriate evaluation at expert center. And I thank you all for uh, this uh, you know, opportunity to uh, engage with you all in this uh, seminar. Thank you for that very uh, comprehensive evaluation of the treatments, including the latest treatments that are available now. Uh, I, I thought that was an excellent thing. And, you know, you brought us up to date on many of the recent advances. Thank you very much, Brigadier Handa. Thank you. Uh, move on to the last of this cycle of talks with Dr. Syed Taushit. Uh, Dr. Syed is my colleague at NIH and somebody I rely on hugely for practically all areas. Uh, Dr. Syed, can you talk to us on CTEF approach and management, please? So I just press one and enter. You should go to the first slide. Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? 
Yeah, can hear you now. Go ahead, please. A uh, very good evening to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Murli Mohan sir and Emerson uh, for giving this opportunity to talk on uh, CTEF, which we feel most of us uh, don't uh, recognize it, and probably the awareness is increasing. And as sir said, uh, facility of echo is increasing. Probably we need to probably will pick up more and more uh, uh, CTEF now. So what exactly is this uh, CTEF? I think sir has described about this uh, definition. Anything uh, pulmonary pressures of more than 20 with a vascular resistance of uh, more than three wood units uh, and the capillary wedge pressure of less than 15 uh, effectively rule out, uh, ruling out the uh, left heart disease with a clot present in the pulmonary vasculature is called as a CTEF. So, Whenever uh, you have an acute pulmonary embolism, most of the time it resolves spontaneously or on treatment. Sometimes due to unknown reasons, it may resolve, it may not resolve completely or it may resolve partially and whatever is remaining may get organized and that leads to chronic stenosis and occlusion of the pulmonary arteries. Due to occlusion of these pulmonary arteries, there might be increase in the pulmonary vasculature resistance and that can precipitate into uh, pulmonary hypertension. So if you see the cumulative incidence, it can uh, vary as low as 0.1% uh, to 9.1% uh, in the first two years of an acute pulmonary event. So most of the European and United States uh, report a incidence of around three to five cases per 100,000 population and very less uh, incidence rate reported in Japan around 1.9 cases. We looked into our data long ago and we saw that the rate of CTEF conversion from an acute pulmonary uh, embolism event was much higher. It was around 20% and most of the uh, patients had non-compliance to the anticoagulation. So who are the patients who, who are at risk for developing this uh, CTEF? Anybody who has APLA, or myeloproliferative disorders, chronic inflammatory states, post splenectomy status, or somebody who has recurrent episodes of venous thromboembolism. Uh, patients with protein C and protein S deficiency, though they are more prone for pulmonary embolism, they may not be as such predisposed to develop CTEF for unknown reasons. Again, same with factor five uh, laden mutations and factor two mutations, they may not be directly prone for developing CTEF. So, as I said, it is the obstruction of the proximal pulmonary arteries due to the organization of the thrombus. But it is not only the reason there is involvement of the small vessel in CTEF. You can have different pathologies uh, why these small vessels get involved in CTEF. As you can see here, in this group of uh, small vessels, the clot reaches to the peripheries, the, even the smaller vessels can get involved and they may have inflammation. This uh, type of vasculature is not amenable for surgical treatment. Or you can have a set of vessels which is beyond normal pulmonary vasculature. Why do you get this uh, small vessel vasculitis? Whatever blood which is supposed to go to this area because of the obstruction, it gets diverted. And vessels over here, they get overloaded, increase stress. Probably that's why they undergo remodeling and they may develop uh, small vessel vasculopathy. And coming to this area, these are the vessels which are located beyond the obstructed pulmonary vasculature. So why do you get vasculitis here? Because of opening of the pre-existing collaterals, that is iotopulmonary collaterals. Once these collaterals open up, these highly compliant non-resistance vasculature get exposed to the systemic pressures. So again, mm -hmm. there is an increased stress on this vasculature. So ultimately, it is not only the proximal vessels which are involved in CTEF, it is the small vessels also play a major role in development of uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension. So once you have uh, 
acute pulmonary embolism it may be large or recurrent pulmonary embolism leading to overload to the lightest system in our body that leads to non resolution or incomplete resolution of the uh, thrombus so this can cause organization of the thrombus occlusion of the large vessels which leads to diversion of the blood to the non occluded vessels and hence as i told earlier increase shear and stress on the small vessel leading to microvasculopathy also because of this occlusion of the large vessels there will be opening of the pre existing systemic shunts and again blood supply is established to the post occluded vessels and hence increase shear and stress on the small vessels beyond the occluded areas leading to microvasculopathy vascular remodeling increased pulmonary vasculature precipitating in ctf so this nitric oxide i think more and much is uh, spoken by dr muli mohan in his slides uh, what it does is it increases cyclic gmp and this is responsible for smooth muscle relaxation on the other side it is an anti inflammatory agent so in ctf patient in the small vessels it is shown that this component di, uh, dimethyl arginine is increased which inhibits this nitric oxide synthetase hence there will be decrease in the nitric oxide so there will be no cyclic gmp and vasoconstriction happens and also it acts as a pro inflammatory state so that's why a lot of drugs have target towards this nitric oxide pathways nowadays in ctf also uh now when do you suspect that patient has a, a pulmonary embolism if the patient comes with disproportionate symptoms or if the patient has chest pain or syncopal attacks and if you feel clinically that you know patient has ctf you uh, do your apart from ecg and echo a transthoracic um, ecg and x ray you do a transthoracic echo and if echo shows features of pulmonary hypertension then you go ahead and do a ventilation perfusion scan so on ventilation perfusion scan if you have mismatch defects at least one uh, involving at least one segmental or two sub segmental areas so more or less you are sure that you know you are dealing with uh, pulmonary embolism ctf and after this you can go ahead with a pulmonary angiogram that ctpa and a right heart cath so we have the privilege of doing everything and we land up discussing around at least two to three cases per week and based on this ct features and right heart cath uh, findings we decide whether the uh, clot load is present in the proximal area whether enough clot load is present which is attributing to the pulmonary hypertension and if the clot load is enough the patient is fit for the surgery patient is subjected for pulmonary endarterectomy which is the gold standard uh, for uh, management of the ctf now if proximal disease is present and if patient is not fit for the surgery if his uh, uh, functional class is not good enough or he has too many comorbidities he is too frail for this usually the patient uh, goes on medical management on the other hand uh on a ct scan predominantly on a ct pulmonary angiogram if we feel the disease is too distal or you have just microvasculopathy without any evidence of clots we land up uh, subjecting the patient to either balloon pulmonary angioplasty or again on a medical management so as a screening tool ecg non specific not sensitive but you can get some clue with these features of right axis deviation right bundle branch block people manel and very rarely you can get this s1q3 t3 pattern not so reliable but can be used uh, with caution x ray again you may not have uh, features of acute pulmonary embolism apart from some uh, oligemia might be there some uh, pulmonary uh, artery being dilated dilated can give a clue that you know we are dealing with uh, uh, ctf again lot of the time uh, we land up seeing normal x rays echo uh, good screening tool 
you can uh, look for features of pulmonary hypertension predominantly so apart from the trz what we look for for uh, diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension you can look all this uh, parameter like rv lv ratio of greater than 1 uh, peak tricuspid regurgitation velocity of more than 2.8 uh, meters per second uh, you can see flattening of interventricular septum and lv eccentricity index saying that you know the right vent right ventricle is uh, uh, over stress enlarge greater than 1.1 or uh, uh, the uh, other important thing is right ventricular outflow acceleration time anything actually less than 105 millisecond says that you know there is increased resistance to the uh, flow outflow tract in the pulmonary artery or early uh, diastolic uh, pr velocity greater than 2.2 uh, meters per second and also you can look for uh, inferior vena cava collapsing less than 50% or a diameter greater than 21 mm again saying right heart problem so also you can look at the right atrium with uh, anything uh, with systolic area greater than 18 uh, cm square gives a clue that there is some problem with the uh, right ventricle and there is stress on the right ventricle so though there are uh, common features for uh, pulmonary hypertension are there any parameters which give uh, more idea about ctef or like you know they are more useful in uh, monitoring of a ctef it is said that you know ctef is a pressure overload uh, state whereas uh, other pulmonary hypertension especially group 1 it is systolic overload features are present so what are this pressure overload one of the most important things is pulmonary acceleration time systolic eccentricity index and tricuspid regurgitation you can look for this and they are more useful for monitoring a ctf patient uh, whereas global right ventricular longitudinal strain free wall right ventricular longitudinal strain rvfsc which dr handa spoke about or a tapsy are more useful in group 1 ph so uh, why do we have to assess them functionally and during exercise so again i think sir has spoken about this 6 minute uh, walk distance it gives an idea about functional exercise capacity and type of rehabilitation program which the patient should be subjected to is dependent on 6 uh, minute walk distance and most of the trials the drug trials are run uh, are done on uh, the 6 minute walk uh, distance and the minimum uh, uh, incremental uh, uh, distance is also decided based on this and the prognosis of a patient also depends on the 6 minute walk test and as your 6 minute walk test i mean walk distance drop you become more and more breathless and uh, the recent guidelines also say that any uh, body who has a 6 minute walk distance more than 500 meters uh usually land up having a good prognosis while anybody with uh, a walk distance of less than 300 meters falls in poor prognostic uh, category uh, in our center i think data of 220 patients showed similar results uh people with uh, group 1 and group 2 and nhya class walked around 488 meters while patients with the uh, class 3 and above walked only about 360 meters with significant uh, uh, fall in the walk distance so coming to cpet uh, which is underutilized i feel lot of information is coming out on uh, cpet i think recent ishct guideline also insist on uh, uh, cpet in uh, ctef so it is shown that greater impairment of uh, ventri- ventilatory efficiency is seen that is ve by vco2 one of the parameters we look in uh, cpet appears to be a characteristic feature of uh, uh, ctef regardless of whether the disease is proximal or distal why do you get this ventilatory impairment because of increased dead space uh, ventilation and it is also said that this v the uh, Uh, increased uh, dead space ventilation can stratify patient with higher mortality risk in distal ctf group but not in the group 1 ph group so more useful parameter i think we need more and more studies we also need to get primed and probably we have to do more and more 
सीपेट टेस्टिंग सो वॉट इज द रोल ऑफ वी क्यू स्कैन वर्चुअली इफ यू आर वी क्यू स्कैन इज रूल्ड मीन्स नॉर्मल दैट मीन्स यू आर रूलिंग आउट सर्जरी फॉर द पेशेंट मीन्स द क्लॉट इज नॉट एक्सेबल और नॉट अवेलेबल फॉर सर्जरीज और इफ यू हैव अ परफ्यूजन डिफेक्ट इन्वॉल्विंग लेस देन फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ ए ब्रॉको पलमेरी ब्रॉको पलमेनरी सेगमेंट आर जनरली नॉट कंसिडर एज एविडेंस फॉर थ्रॉम्बो एम्बोलिक डिसीजेस एंड Uh, subtle, small, subsegmental, and non-segmental defects are found even in idiopathic PH that we have to keep in mind. So, uh, VQ scan has a role in uh, post-surgery also. I'm not going to go into detail. We have seen lot of re-expansion pulmonary edema and what we call it as uh, uh, you you get uh, mismatch defects in uh, areas where the patient have been operated. All those are there. probably uh, sometime we can discuss about that so ct pulmonary angiogram very useful tool uh, heavily we rely on this and very high sensitivity and specificity so what all you see in a ct pulmonary angiogram you directly visualize a clot or you get some indirect evidence of a clot and you also uh, have some proof for pulmonary hypertension on a ct pulmonary angiogram so you can see here on the uh, right hand uh, side corner in acute clot uh, you can see that the clot is floating the contrast is uh, surrounding the clot and whatever angle uh, the clot makes with the wall is acute i mean uh, acute angle that's why it is uh, acute uh, clot while when you see a chronic clot usually it is eccentric and the angulation what it makes is an obtuse angle you may have this flaps webs or bands in a uh, chronic clot other important thing is bronchopulmonary collaterals you can see in this huge number of collaterals and that this is something which uh, very important in distinguishing uh, ctf from a uh, uh, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension if you see a, a cath you can see the aorta pulmonary uh, collaterals here and most likely it is a uh, ctf while you can see here there are no collaterals from the aorta so most likely we are dealing with a primary pulmonary hypertension in this case so what are the indirect evidence of pulmonary vascular obstruction uh, localized oligemia means the uh, you you may not see vessels reaching the periphery and uh, you may not uh, see the distal pulmonary arteries at all so the other thing which i spoke about was evidence of ph how do you see that indirect evidence is mosaic uh, uh, perfusion on uh, lung windows uh, or uh, mpa versus aorta diameter greater than 1 and uh, if you take the definite value anything uh, pa diameter more than 29 mm is suggestive of pulmonary hypertension and if your rv lv ratio on a ct scan is greater than 1.5 it is considered as uh, severe uh, ph and bowing of the intraventricular septum uh, towards the left side also gives an evidence that you know we are dealing with uh, severe pulmonary hypertension coming to right heart cath needs lot of expertise though it is a gold standard i think most of the patients who are undergoing uh, pulmonary endarterectomy any decision in our center is uh, heavily dependent on a right heart uh, cath it uh, also helps in not only diagnosis to prognosticate and response to the therapy i think sir has spoken to about the uh, response to the therapy so these are the parameters uh, which you look for in uh, uh, pulmonary uh, right heart cath uh, uh most important thing is of course the mean pulmonary arterial pressure you can assess systolic pulmonary arterial pressure diastolic pulmonary arterial pressure and there is something called as pulmonary artery pulse pressure which is nothing but the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure and the other important parameter which has been described uh, recently is called as fractional pulse artery pressure that is nothing but the ratio of pulmonary uh, pulse pressure versus 
mean pulmonary arterial pressure it gives an idea about the pulsality of your elastic arteries that is your main pulmonary arteries so it is usually higher in ctf patient due to the involvement of the proximal pulmonary arteries so if your fpap is on the lesser side less likely that you know the clot is amenable for surgery so rough estimate but we need uh, more and more study on this i feel it's a good uh, indicator uh, sometimes we see patients where you have clot load you have uh, some other disease also involved for example there was a osa patient which was discussed in the morning we don't know what was contributing more for the ph though the clot load was enough we were not able to take a decision whether the patient has to be subjected to uh, surgery or not probably this indicator may give a better idea in future so as i said pulmonary endarterectomy is the treatment of choice what are you achieving by doing a pulmonary endarterectomy first of all you are restoring the blood supply so by doing that you are decreasing the rv strain which was caused by the increased pulmonary vascular resistance and also by removing the obstruction you are improving your vq mismatch and hence you are further preventing the right ventricular dysfunction and extension of the obstruction beyond so on histopathology you can classify clots uh, i mean the specimens into type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 most common what we see is uh, type 2 uh, most of the specimens are autopsy uh, specimens you can see in type 1 is only seen around 20% of cases and thrombus is seen in the major pulmonary uh, vasculature while the most commonly seen is thickened intima and some webs no major vessel thrombus can be seen and type 3 is totally distal uh, disease subsegmental and segmental again seen in around 15 to 20% of patient type 4 usually it is intrinsic small ves vessel disease no clot no ctf in this uh, specimens so what is our experience in endarterectomy i think we have crossed more than 600 patient uh, so far we have published uh, data of around 591 patient uh, definite improvement in our uh, functional class 6 minute walk distance was shown the other important thing what i wanted to highlight is the mortality though the mortality is much higher when compared to Uh, other experienced centers we had a mortality of around the 15.7% uh, initially and it has reduced to 9.1 uh, in the recent past significant reduction in the mortality rate probably we are growing in uh, experience and also uh, mdt is playing a lot of uh, role we are selecting uh, right cases for probably pulmonary endarterectomy that's why the mortality is also coming down so it is not that most of the patients are subjected for pulmonary endarterectomy in our uh, center in across the center rather so small study but still we saw like how many patients were not uh, subjected for uh, surgery and this was published in uh, napcon so around 22.4% of patients out of 49 patients uh, number is low but still uh, significant information it is giving that you know they were not subjected for surgery and the most common reason was uh, they had distal disease and few of them had uh, multiple comorbidities and they were too frail so not all of them are subjected for pulmonary endarterectomy the other uh, uh, new tool in the box is pulmonary angioplasty i think uh, we have done around 25 to 26 cases uh, so far so it is uh, considered in uh, patients who are technically inoperable or who are at high risk for complications due to surgery due to underlying comorbidities like severe copd or they are too frail and patients who are not amenable for surgery and are not responding to uh, medical line of management and also in some uh, post surgical cases if the clot is persistent and if the patient is symptomatic and if if you feel the pressure is still high you can uh, subject the patient for balloon pulmonary angioplasty how does it help 
whatever stent you're placing, it uh, compresses the fibrous uh, thrombi, it causes uh, cracks and tears and dissection and leads to uh, vascular wall stretching and formation of microchannels and establishing the blood flow. Uh, you can see here is the pointer, yeah. You can see here there was no blood flow beyond this and uh, this is one of our patients and BPA was done and it has re-established the circulation. Uh, so the mean pressure in whatever patients we have done so far was shown to decrease significantly and six minute walk uh, distance also was shown to increase significantly after BPA uh, was done. So coming to the medical therapy, again, who are not inoperable, comorbidities and with residual pH after endotrectomy, all can be subjected to uh, medical therapy. Also, as a bridge for surgery, you can put the patient on medical therapy. These are the drugs available. I think most of uh, these drugs have been uh, discussed in detail by uh, Dr. Murli Mohan. I'm not going to go into the detail. Uh, Riosigwat is the treatment of choice, time being for CTF patients. This slide, I think, uh, I don't want to spend much time. Just remember that Riosi uh, and Sildenafil both act on on the same pathway at this moment remember you cannot use same drug of same pathway at uh, same time and other uh, things which act on prostacycline pathway is celixipag and endothelial receptor antagonists like ambrisentan and bosentan macitentan can be used these are the major trials uh, for medical uh, treatment in a uh, ctf group of patient so most important trials which have shown some significant uh, uh, improvement is the merit trial for macitentan and uh, this is for trepoprostinil and the other important is Riosi, the chest trial. So merit trial, you can see here, there was significant uh, increase in six minute walk distance and the mean pulmonary artery pressure also significantly decreased when compared to the uh, control group uh, in a dose of 10 milligrams uh, daily. Uh, while if you see trepoprostinil group, again, uh, some increase in six minute walk uh, distance and some drop in uh, mean pulmonary arterial pressure, though not so uh, significant, but compared to the uh, control group, good enough. Uh, now the Riosi, I think I'll talk about Riosi in little bit detail. So it's a landmark trial. We have uh, initially chest one was there. Now we have gone through the open label study. Chest two study is also there. So efficacy of Riosigwat in patient with inoperable recurrent CTEF. These were the demographics of the chest trial. And these were the number of patients who were uh, uh, subjected to this uh, uh, Riosi trial. And you can see here, most of them were in... Uh, three and four uh, class symptoms and average six minute walk distance were around 342 in a ROC group and around 350 in your uh, placebo group. So primary endpoint uh, change from, that is a significant improvement in six minute walk distance was seen. So at the end of uh, 16 weeks, you can see here the patient's who are on ROC showed a improve, improvement in the six minute walk distance and it was sustained while in the placebo group initially they showed some improvement because of other drugs also and finally uh, at the end of 16 week they showed that you know there was significant uh, drop in the six minute walk distance. So other endpoints again were meant vascular resistance decreased significantly and your cardiac index improved and your uh, MPAP, though not specified endpoint, significant improvement was uh, shown. So functional class at 16 weeks, you can see here number of patients who were stable and improved were much higher when compared to your uh, uh, control group. So how do you titrate a dose uh, of ROC if your systolic BP is more than 100, you, you can safely increase by 0.5, usually you start with one 
uh, milligrams TID, then you increase and reach up to a dose of 2.5 milligrams three times a day. If your BP is between 90, systolic BP is between 90 to 100, maintain the same dose. If your BP is falling down with symptoms of hypotension, reduce the dose by 0.5 milligrams. So what are the contraindications? Pregnancy, of course, you cannot give ReoC uh, go on because of its teratogenic uh, effect. And other important thing, as I told earlier, any other nitrate uh, producers or nitric oxide donors cannot be given along with ReoC. And also your phosphodiesterase inhibitors like sildenafil, tadalafil, all those cannot be used along with ReoC. And if you have to switch over to uh, REOC from all these phosphodiesterase inhibitors, if you are using tadalafil, wait for 48 hours at least. If you are uh, using sildenafil earlier, you have to wait at least for 24 hours. So patient with pulmonary hypertension associated with idiopathic interstitial pneumonias should not be given with REOC. I think uh, as uh, Handa sir was telling, trials are under uh, uh, going on, probably we might get more data. So all this while I spoke about clot, how to remove it, what is the alternative option. But one thing always you have to remember that, you know, whatever you see, you are seeing clots, but it may not always be a thromboembolic clot. So you can get uh, uh, shockers. I think this is one of the patients where uh, we initially thought it is a clot and a thrombus in the right uh, ventricular outflow tract. And uh, we landed up seeing on a biopsy that you know patient had uh, myxomas. Uh, myxomas are not uncommon. We see a lot of myxomas nowadays. And the key is that you know how are the pulmonary vasculature, whether these pulmonary vessels are tapered, narrowed, or they are dilated. I think uh, because of the experience, our radiologists are able to tell us like you know we need to suspect something else also. We. Uh, see, uh, I think we have seen uh, pulmonary angiosarcomas also apart from this. So you should be very careful in uh, uh, picking up these things. So in summary, CTEF is a life-threatening complication of an acute uh, PE. It goes unrecognized often, though it is not so difficult to diagnose it nowadays. And echocardiography, uh, if you have echocardiography features of PH, suspect that you know patient is having uh, CTEF if your symptoms and signs are not matching. And VQ scan and CTP are good tools with high sensitivity and specificity for CTEF. And endarterectomy is the treatment of choice for CTEF. And BPA is upcoming is an alternative option if the patient is not eligible for endarterectomy. And out of all the medications, uh, REOC is the only approved drug for inoperable CTEF and for uh, bridging for therapy. Thanks. Dr. Syed, thank you very much for that very, very comprehensive talk and, uh, you know, covering all aspects of CTEF. Uh, I think the very important uh, points made by both of you uh, are about, you know, choosing the patient correctly, finding out, as uh, Dr. Handa said, uh, who has lung predominant pulmonary hypertension and which is more likely to be a major component of pulmonary arterial hypertension, where which is the only group where drugs should be used, uh, pulmonary exactive drugs to be specific. And he also brought out the VA study, which showed very clearly that mortality was higher in patients who had uh, pulmonary hypertension due to a group 2 or group 3 pH and where pulmonary artery, arterial pulmonary vasoactive drugs were medicines were used. Giving us a little bit of hope was the INSPIRE study, where there were some improvements in patients with IPF and pulmonary hypertension. But I think we need to wait for more studies. Uh, and, you know, decide which group of patients when we specifically say that pulmonary vasoactive medications can be used. Dr. Syed has also brought out very clearly that surgery, surgery and surgery are the most important uh, considerations for patients with CTEF. Uh, where patients are unsuitable for surgery, for whatever reason, distal disease or patient is unwilling, then balloon pulmonary achioplasty is the second choice. 
and medications, mainly uh, Priyosiguat, are the only choices really. Uh, they have tried Macetentan in some studies and the other drugs have been used, but the best results clearly come with RIOC. So uh, I'm going to stop talking at this point, but I think I would like my colleagues to answer some questions. Uh, do we have time, uh, Mr. Jain, Mr. Uh, Ramanuj, to take questions because it's already pretty late? Can we take a few questions? There are something like 22 questions here. I'm sure we don't have time for all. Yeah, there are some repeated questions, sir. You can uh, take only a few questions which are very important. Some questions have already been answered by you and uh, other doctors also during the, your session. So you can take... The first question really is a very interesting one. Uh, it says, as November is pH Awareness Month, what can we suggest to pH patients? Can I request both my colleagues, Dr. Handa first and then Dr. Syed, to tell us, you know, what can we use uh, to improve awareness of pH, both to doctors and to patients? Uh, what, what should we do with them? Uh, for <clears throat> for uh, increasing the awareness of uh, pH among doctors, I think this is the session which we are doing rightly for uh, spreading the awareness. Uh, think pH, screen pH in patients who are uh, who are having the disproportionate symptoms more than their lung or heart disease uh, is a request to all our colleagues who are de uh, dealing with these patients because the diagnostic delay means uh, you're losing valuable time and mortality. For the patients, uh, always seek uh, timely care for any symptom which is out of proportion to your basic disease. It may be an exacerbation of COPD or a heart failure. Don't keep sitting on it. Go to the hospital. The doctors know best. They will do the best for you. I'm going to jump to uh, you know, a question about lung transplant for Dr. Syed. Dr. Syed, uh, there's a very specific question here. My son is 13-year-old, suffering from IPH. How far double lung and heart transplant will be successful is the question. Dr. Sai, I think you're muted. Okay. Pulmonary hypertension itself is an indication for a double lung transplant. You don't do a single lung transplant when you have pulmonary hypertension. And of course, we see the right ventricular function also. If right ventricular function is very low, so preferably, I think uh, we have to go ahead with the heart lung transplant rather than uh, double lung transplant. So he needs evaluation and... Uh, probably a right heart cath will uh, do and he needs to be uh, worked up in a uh, expertise center for uh, lung transplant to decide regarding heart lung or the, uh, only bilateral lung transplant but definitely by lung bilateral lung transplant at this moment i think the question specifically also asked how successful what is the success rates in uh, transplant uh, in ph uh, personal experience, I think uh, we don't have any uh, so far uh, cases where we have done uh, for pulmonary hypertension in adults also. Uh, but overall uh, experience, if you see the Western literature, it is not so bad. Uh, uh, patients with COPD, patient with cystic fibrosis, then interstitial lung disease and probably I, uh, idiopathy pulmonary hypertension. Uh, this is the survival uh, rate in order. Uh, and it's still about uh, five-year survival, about 70% yeah. overall. Around 4.5 to 5 years, immediate survival. So, uh, another good question, how to choose between Masitentan and Abricentan? Uh, Dr. Handa, would you like to take that? Uh, Dr. Handa, you're muted. I, I would request you to go ahead because I haven't used Masitentan. Okay, so honestly, there's not much difference between Masitentan and Ambrisentan. Uh, both are once-a-day drugs. Both are reasonably safe in liver disease. One of the big, uh, you know, problems when you are using Bosentan is a Bosentan and uh, Sildenafil have interactions. So you need to halve the dose when you are using it. Uh, we don't run into that problem when we're using Ambrisentan and Tadalafil or Masitentan and Tadalafil. These days, practically all treatment is com combination treatment. We can start with one, but very soon we move to the other, move to dual therapy. And that's mostly to see how the person tolerates it.
make sure there are no adverse effects and then carry on rapidly moving into the dual uh, therapy uh, so between the two i honestly don't think there's much difference there is no head to head trial of acetentan and abdesentan so you know i think it's uh, you know your choice uh, not much difference in costs not much difference in outcomes do use what you're familiar with would be my advice uh, there's another question on uh, systemic sclerosis and pulmonary hypertension what's the correlation and how to proceed i think dr handa that is probably best addressed to you yeah so uh, as we discussed during the talk also the pulmonary hypertension and systemic sclerosis can be uh, related to pulmonary arterial hypertension that is group 1 and uh, that uh, will be benefited by the use of uh, all the anti ph medications uh, which can be started uh, early after assessment of right heart catheterization and vasodilator testing as against that if there is presence of a significant component of interstitial lung disease then the therapy would be more towards assessment for component of uh, no lung involvement and uh, oxygen and uh, uh, less less so of uh, you know apart from using the immunomodulatory therapy of systemic sclerosis so i think a very important thing is there again like in other lung disease you decide how much is the ild component and how much is the ph component and uh, you know the approaches are completely different there Uh, another question important question how long we have to continue anticoagulants after surgical treatment of ctef dr sayed is uh, most of the time it is lifelong they need to continue for uh, lifelong yeah i think there is no question about it. it is lifelong treatment so you need to be very aware of that uh, yeah. we've had patients who've taken it for some time stopped it and come back with recurrence of clot so i think that must message must come up front uh the question call, saying uh, and i think i may i postponed answering this how do we calculate mean pulmonary artery pressure from pulmonary artery systolic pressure uh my residents have started calling it pasp these days so i'll also use the term pasp uh mean pulmonary artery pressure is roughly calculated there's no there are three different formula given the one which is most accepted widely and that we use is psp into 0.61 plus 2 so for example if the mean pulmonary artery sorry the pulmonary artery systolic pressure is 40 then you take 0.61 into 40 that becomes approximately 0.24 uh, 24 point something add to so the mean pulmonary artery pressure will be 26 okay so that is one of the uh, calculations that is used there are others people prefer to use their own i think we are most comfortable and find this correlates best with the uh mean pulmonary artery pressure calculated at right heart catheterization two other important questions i think coming up uh, i'd like to take them early and then we'll see vaccination in pulmonary artery hypertension patients any issue in the future uh would either of you like to take that because i'm not aware of any specific data vaccination ph patients any issue in the future uh i think pulmonary artery uh, hypertension patients as well as ph patients due to other subgroup are at an increased risk of hospitalizations and both the vaccines which are used in chronic lung diseases namely influenza vaccine and uh, pneumococcal vaccines should be offered in a timely manner at uh, initial uh, interaction uh, uh, I, and there is no no specific uh, problem or contraindication to the use of conventional vaccines and um, uh, covid vaccine too absolutely the thing is you know many of these patients are on uh, anticoagulation uh, and i'd like to emphasize that anticoagulation is not a contraindication to vaccination of any kind including covid 19 in fact i'm i'm more confident because there have been reports of patients with the uh, covid vaccination getting into vascular issues thrombotic issues patients are already on anticoagulation my expectation be they have less of a problem all you have to do is ensure that pressure on the injection site is maintained for a long time you know for the average patient you will keep it for maybe a minute for patients who are on anticoagulation maintain sustained pressure firm pressure over the injection site for about 10 minutes uh dr sayed there is also a question on 
what is the risk for the CTF patient in COVID-19? Are they at greater risk or uh, is there a, you know, any data on that? I think we have seen uh, um, uh, uh, not only CTF, I think uh, uh, vascular events as such, like, you know, CNS vascular events, peripheral vascular events. We have seen a lot of uh, vascular event. Definitely there is uh, enough data suggesting that, you know, uh, pulmonary embolism uh, was seen and uh, one of the cause for mortality was also uh, pulmonary embolism. Definite evidence that, you know, risk is uh, increased and uh, even CVAs were seen, uh, peripheral vascular diseases were seen. It, it increases the, uh, means hypercoagul state it induces. Anything Dr. Anda, yes, please. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Sayed said that uh, you know, uh, pulmonary uh, thromboembolism, deep venous thrombosis, other uh, circulatory thrombotic states. Uh, I think uh, we've been um, we've been hit with a virus which causes uh, lung parenchymal involvement, pulmonary vascular involvement. So it can uh, cause group uh, three and uh, group uh, four and probably group one. Uh, it it'll have to be seen uh, in the coming years if there is a surge in. Uh, uh, cases of pulmonary hypertension. Fortunately, they have been all uh, self-resolving like uh, the experience of uh, pulmonary thromboembolism in uh, non-COVID patients. You know, our experience, I, I, I only know, I think, one or two patients with CTEF who developed COVID. One is our, uh, one of my longest standing patients. She was operated on by us in 2008. Uh, still doing very well. She was admitted with us, Dr. Syed will remember, a few months ago. Uh, she's been in touch with me. Even today, she messaged me. Uh, and she did very well, despite having COVID. I was honestly terrified that she's going to go downhill. She's a young lady. Uh, she was about 12 or 13 when we operated on her. And uh, she's done very well, actually. She has pretty nasty disease, uh, but she's done well. So, I think the fact that they're already on anticoagulation seems to mitigate some of these vascular effects. Uh, and this is the same experience we've had with COVID-19 in our you know, patients with asthma, COPD, ILD. We thought they'd all do much worse. And because of the precautions they've taken, the fact that they are vaccinated against other in uh, infections, like Dr. Handa said, seems to provide some degree of protection to them. Uh, I'm Last two questions, because I think it's getting really late. Uh, again, both these questions I'm going to conflate into one. Uh, are oxygen pumps required for pH patients during travel? Uh, Dr. Handa, would you put your patients with pulmonary hypertension on uh, oxygen when they are in? I assume this is air travel, and you're the yes. expert in this area. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. If he is hypoxemic on the uh, ground, the patient of chronic lung disease, irrespective whether he has got pulmonary hypertension or not, if he is hypoxic on, on ground level, he needs to fly with oxygen on board because the hypoxic environment of the aircraft will will be as if he is at ten thousand feet and his uh, uh, you know oxygenation will drop. And there can be acute uh, pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, and you need to travel with oxygen support. If they have pulmonary hypertension, then more so they need to be careful, especially if he has got hypoxemia and pulmonary hypertension. Then um, generally, uh, you know, proper assessment, including an arterial blood gas, uh, may be in order. So if you uh, are flying, as uh, Dr. Handa said, at seven to 10,000 feet, you're likely to become more hypoxic and that will produce more vasoconstriction and produce an acute deterioration in people with pulmonary hypertension. So we use a very rough cutoff. This is what is given in the BTS guidelines that anybody with a saturation at rest, uh, on room air, uh, at sea level basically of 94% and less needs to be evaluated. Uh, one of the few places that you can do it is in the Institute of Aerospace Medicine, where you can be put into a hypoxic chamber and, you know, the saturation, sorry, the FiO2 reduced to what you'd expect at seven to 10,000 feet. Uh, but I think the simple answer without going through all that is if the person is hypoxic, even below 94%, advise oxygen during travel on flight. So I think that is a simple thing. And 
the airline will insist you fill in a form. It's called a medif form, a medical information form that you have to fill in, suggesting what is the level of oxygen, what all help the person needs. Do they need it while moving to the airport, in the airport, to the aircraft, in the aircraft, and so on. So that's a comp, you know, fairly comprehensive form that you'll have to fill in. Last question I'm going to take because I mean I think it's really late for everyone is how will yoga help the pH patient and suggest to us how you can give supportive care to pH patients? Uh, either of you, I'll leave it to both of you. Uh, so I, I'll just mention about yoga. So yoga is essentially uh, an uh, uh, indigenous uh, form of exercise. Essentially, if you extrapolate it, yoga forms a component of most pulmonary rehabilitation programs. And we already discussed it in the beginning of uh, our talk that pulmonary reha rehabilitation should be instituted early in a patient to maximize his capacity to be independent. It will improve his uh, endurance. It will improve his effort tolerance. It will improve his quality of life. Uh, I think I'll leave the second part to Syed. Dr. Syed, can you take the second part? You know, what supportive okay. treatment do you give for any patient with pulmonary hypertension? Uh, specifically for CTEF, maybe when they come to us? Uh, as Sir said, I think most important thing is the rehabilitation. That's the most important supportive uh, treatment. And of course, they have to be on anticoagulation, lifelong anticoagulation before surgery also, if they are subjected. And uh, as I spoke, uh, medical treatment, uh, patient has to be on... Uh, uh, if uh, pulmonary pressures are high, I think we put them on Riosi as a bridge therapy. And if, uh, most of the time we prefer uh, vitamin K antagonists like acitrom and warfarin. So, of course, the diet advice has to be given. What diet advice uh, they have to take? What are the things they have to avoid? Because a lot of food uh, interactions will be there with acitrom and uh, warfarin. And a regular follow-up is something which probably... Uh, we need to have every six months or something, the patient has to come back and at least do a echo to look for what is happening to his uh, uh, pulmonary pressure. And of course, patient uh, uh, might require a lot of diuretics and uh, uh, if they are in failure, like, you know, uh, low salt diet, uh, fluid restriction, all those things have to be there. And I think key for uh, this one is uh, uh, rehabilitation, I think. So really, I think uh, that answers it very comprehensively. We've had uh, both our uh, uh, you know, panelists give you very comprehensive answers. I particularly like yoga because it, you know, as Dr. Handa said, it's culturally acceptable to our people. And in my opinion, should form an integral part of any pulmonary rehabilitation program. Is this based on evidence? No, it's not based on evidence. But, uh, you know, our experience is that it's very good. Uh, for uh, all, all forms of cardiopulmonary disease. So cardiopulmonary rehabilitation, I think, is where we really need to be moving more and more towards. I'm going to really stop at this point. We've been, you know, talking for a long time. I really appreciate the patience of the audience and the patience of my panelists because, you know, we planned this for one hour and I think we've been going on for more than two hours, two and a half hours almost. Uh, so my immense thanks to uh, Dr. Handa, Dr. Syed, and of course, to the MSN team and the technical team handling this. Uh, thank you for your patience. And most of all, the audience who've sat and listened to us for more than two and a half hours, almost two and a half hours. Thank you all so much. I hand back to Mr. Ramanuja for uh, taking things to the end. Thank you very much, sir. On behalf of MSN, I thank Dr. Murli Mohan, sir, Dr. Ajay Handa, sir, and Dr. Sayas, sir, for your enlightened session on management of uh, diagnosis and management of PAH. I'm sure, sir, the session is very informative. I also thank all our guest, uh, guest doctors who have attended in spite of your busy schedule. Thank you very much. And I have an appeal, sir. MSN has got entire range of uh, PAH products starting from PAH, our brand of sildenafil citrate, Tadalafil, our brand is Tadavas. We have got Pulmonex, sir, our brand of Ambricentan. Pulmonex kit is a combi pack of Ambricentan with Tadalafil. We have got Mesitent, our brand of Mesitentan. And shortly, we are also coming out with uh, Selexi pack, maybe in a couple of months' time. 
and uh, we have also got Rio C, our brand of Rio C guards, sir. So this is the entire range we have available. I look forward for your patronage so that we can come out with more and more innovative and uh, affordable medicine. Uh, and we would like to partner with doctors like you in reducing the sufferings of uh, the chronic uh, pulmonary patients. So thank you very much once again, sir. Good night. Thank you. And our request is please bring Selexipag as soon as possible. Definitely. Yeah, our patients are desperate. We are desperate. Thank, Thank you, so much. you so much. I think, great, sir. I think one of our patients is already on Selexipag. Importing uh, it. They're importing yeah, it. And, yeah. you know, in COVID, I realized that the supply chain is not constant. And you start yeah, think, on it, uh, you suddenly it drop it, from, it becomes uh, difficult. Hmm? So if they bring it locally, we'll be assured of the supply. I don't think any other company is manufacturing it. MSN is the first one that has promised to bring it up. Yes, sir. Yeah? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you all very much. And uh, thank you to both my panelists. And thank hope you. we can meet again very soon. Thank you. Good night. Night all.